I'm just going to do a couple quick quick announcements and, and such, and then uh, we've got two uh, two people to hear from that we want to get more deeply engaged with the Hammer research mission as we go forward. And and um, again, as we go forward with this whole thing, uh, if anybody has suggestions on things we should cover in Hammer Time, would like to do something, let me let me know. Uh, we'll, we'll do that. This is kind of a, the open forum for lots of people to uh, uh, to to get ideas out there and I'll do a little bit of that today. So um, today again, Groundhog Day, um, welcome to it. And a couple little announcements. So, so number one, um, NSF, oops, went too far. NSF has a, a new program announcement they just put out, if you haven't seen this yet, on uh, the creating of a manufacturing systems integration program. And uh, there'll be a a webinar Tuesday, 10 a.m. Eastern time, if anybody would like to, to be part of that. But they but this is closely related to what Hammer does. It's manufacturing systems. Um, it, you know, in there uh, focuses on fundamental research addressing things. Uh, you know, my personal preference is you you do, do things that that you know are have fundamental components, but also um, also really make a difference to, to industry. And that's why I'm very glad we have this ERC program. But they do call out uh, wanting to do a lot of things that are near and dear to our hearts. And it also calls out that this is a good place, particularly for things like, like career awards. So for junior faculty, um, we'd be happy to try to see if Hammer can help with that. That's, um, that's good. Second big announcement is um, our Hammer spring meeting. Uh, we've got on the books, it'll be uh, May 18th and 19th, which is a Thursday, Friday. All Hammer members, uh, student affiliates, uh, deans are welcome, encouraged to come. The first one will be at Ohio, at Ohio State here. Future meetings will move to partner institutions. Uh, big agenda. It's the first time that we'll have a large group to come together to get to get to know one another. Uh, we'll have status updates on projects, thrusts, test beds. We'll be doing some analyses on what we are doing well, not we're not doing well, things like uh, uh, SWOT analyses, strengths, weaknesses, threats, opportunities, um, industry engagement. That'll happen. And we're likely, this is tentative, to have our NSF site visit, first site visit the day before that, which I think is going to be a uh, uh, early friend, you know, kind of a first meeting. And uh, I think this is to give us some uh, little bit of uh, simple, uh, tough love, but uh, uh, which is good. Um, those of you here, we're starting to get members on board. Uh, please uh, let these people, please get people signed up and uh, let Kathy and me know. Um, we have a industry liaison uh, a person joining us, Phil Chizik who's got great contacts with the Department of Defense and others, and he's got a, a doctorate in international business and such, so he's in a great position to help us form our industry ecosystem. So that's that's awesome. Um, big thing I've been thinking about, uh, in addition to you know kind of the real technical stuff that we, we think about here is, is how we develop really a culture that gets things that gets things done, really allows us to innovate and do things that are useful to industry and move um, you know, United States technology forward, regional technology, and those are the members. And one book I know has been influential with people on the National Science Board is something called The Rainforest, The Secret of Building the Next Silicon Valley. And the short summary is really this slide, is really uh, you know, work together, be a good person, don't be self-centered, but, but uh, trust and be trusted, seek fairness, not advantage pay forward, listen, things like that. These are the things that we want to do. And this is really comes from a thoughtful analysis of what, what's worked in Silicon Valley. And you know, when you look even deeper, I think there's a couple of places in Silicon Valley that have really, really outperformed. And um, one of them is uh, Xerox Palo Alto Research Center between the period of about 1970 and 1985. And, and a lot of huge, huge things were done there. And what's really impressive is Bell Labs is often pointed to as a, a place that did great things. But uh, Xerox Park back in, you know, it, it's kind of its heyday of 1985, only had 350 researchers, whereas Bell Labs had about 25,000. So they, they really punched above their weight class. And things like graphical user interfaces were really brought to life there. 
Uh, they did a lot with lasers for laser printing, reading and writing optical, optical disks. And some things that are really, I think, close to where we want to go with Hammer is they also developed uh, structured, very large, very large uh, scale uh, integrated circuit design there based on really trying to simplify and get that out. And I'm starting to read about what they did there to really simplify and teach that. And that's one of the things they did. And one of the things that, that I think really enabled that and, and made that really impactful was they made sure they produced value by building hardware. That was one of the things they really baked in was, was building hardware and trying to do this for kind of hundred users at a time. And as we go forward, this is something I think we're gonna like to push with Hammer is really a focus on projects that we can scale in some degree, not just writing papers. And, and there is good evidence base that this is a good way to drive things that really create lasting value. Uh, Xerox is interesting, a lot of great things happened there but they did, a, a, I think, a lousy job of capturing what they had. They really were, were the leader there. And then companies like Apple, Hewlett Packard and so forth went on with things like the Macintosh laser printer and so forth. And it didn't really stick with Xerox uh, to, despite that. But, but again, that's not our goal is to make, um, make money. It wouldn't be bad, but our goal is to really get technology out. So anyway, just, just something to think about. Uh, we, I'm gonna put, put some little things like this out forward. That's um, where we're at. So for now, um, I want to go on to the, the 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 next thing, which is really the main course of today. This is kind of a little amuse and appetizer. Main course today is we're gonna have two talks by people that uh, we really want to get um, to know better here. First of them being uh, Dave Helsley here in Ohio State Mechanical Engineering, who comes to us from uh, oh, five-ish years ago from Notre Dame, where we poached him uh, from there. And uh, he's been doing some great work on, on um, uh, additive manufacturing and control systems. And then we'll go directly after that to Vic Castillo, who's a senior research scientist at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. And he's been working on a lot of things where he's again using machine learning and um, systems to, to, to get information out of, uh, out of interesting uh, manufacturing systems. And um, and both again hardware and software, and um, I'm going to turn it now first to Dave, and then to Vic, and then we might have a little bit of time to talk at the end of this. So um, um, I think uh, Dave, you should be in a position where you should be able to share your screen. Yeah, which are you seeing my screen or the slides? Seeing perfect. You're, you're up and going. Okay, great. Let me hide all these. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, I'm muted, but you're coming through. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Great. So, so what I'm going to try and do here is, is talk about one, one uh, project that we've been working on for, for quite a few years now that has a lot of um, overlap with Hammer. And before we get into that, I do want to um, give credit where credit's due here. So this is essentially the um, the short version of Nathaniel Wood's uh, PhD defense that he'll be giving at the end of this semester. So, so Nate did all the hard lifting here. Um, just as kind of a note, he'll soon be doing a postdoc at Michigan under Chinandam Akwadure, which I believe some of you are, are familiar with. So he's going to be off doing his um, um, similar work at, at Michigan, and then we'll be on the job market for those sort of universities um, in a few years. So please keep him in mind. Um, this is a, a work that was funded uh, primarily by AFRL with um, I think some names that some of you are familiar with here have been a part of this, this project here. Okay, so so I first thing I want to do is bring up a slide that everyone should be familiar with. Um, so this is from Thrust 4, Objective 1, as presented to the National Science Foundation. And um, I want to particularly focus on this one here because that's what um, this presentation is most relevant to is this idea of having uh, model, predict model predictive control to control um, hammer processes. And so that is a schematic as given in the proposal and presentations. Here's a, a somewhat simplified version of your typical um, feedback loop. So this would be more relevant to, to hammer, we'll say, uh, because it has like incremental forming game in it, but a general process whether this be autonomous vehicles or just cruise control in your car or whatever it have, may be, control loops look like essentially what you see in this block diagram here. 
So the, the fundamental things I want to point out to you are, um, well, three variables. Uh, one is how we define our outputs. In general, we can have, say, P of these, and that is what we're measuring. So, all right, so what have we um, purchased sensors for, and where do we place them, all right? You have Q inputs in general. Um, this would be what actuators do we buy, and where do we place those? And then we have a, a system, right? And our system is going to have states. And in general, we have N states. And these are um, oftentimes, you can think of these as, as the entire dis dynamic description of a system is the states. And in general, uh, not all states can be measured. So I'll show an example when we get to powder diffusion of, of where the majority of the states can be measured. And so the control objective in general is design what's called a state estimator. I'll talk about this a little bit more in more detail here. Um, and state feedback, K, this would be the simple version of MPC. MPC is a more complicated version of this feedback law here to drive the states X to our desired state. So think of cruise control of your car. One of your states is velocity. How do you drive your velocity to say 65 miles per hour if you set it, your car at 65 miles per hour? Okay. So I wanted to go through, because I, I realize that most people on this call are not in the field of, of um, systems and systems analysis. So I wanted to go through uh, what I'm calling linear systems analysis 101. And um, two definitions that are, I would say, called the, the lay person's definitions is one is called controllability. And so controllability means the ability to affect the states of the system with the inputs. And observability is the ability to infer the values of internal states from the measurements. Okay, so I'm a mechanical engineer, so I'm giving a mechanical example here. But let's take this two mass system. And I have an actuator here. And I have a sensor here. So I'm actuating or forcing the first mass. And I'm measuring the position of this first mass. Um, but I'm doing nothing with the second mass. And so I think this is a pretty obvious case where we would deem this system to be not controllable, not observable, because we are not measuring this mass and we are not forcing it in any way. So it's just going to do whatever it's going to do. It's a mass floating in space, right? So this mass is not controllable, not observable. And if we consider the entire system to be both both masses, we'd say that the system is not controllable, not observable. So I think that that's a, a kind of an obvious um, example. If we start to do something different, if we change the dynamics of our system by say coupling these two masses. So now we have a spring and a damper connecting mass one and mass three, even though that we haven't changed how we actuate the system and we haven't changed how we sense the system or measure the system, there you can prove that the system is both controllable and observable. So, so basically I can force mass one and by doing it appropriately, I can control the positions of both mass one and mass two or mass three, I mean. And also by knowing a measurement of the position of mass one, I also can infer or estimate the position of mass three over here. And so the first thing to kind of take away here is that the system dynamics determine, um, partially determine controllability and observability. The other thing that we can do is we can change which sensors and actuators that we, we buy and slap on the system. So if I go back to my previous case where the two masses are not coupled, but I now put an actuator on this third, what we call M3 here, this system is controllable because I can control mass one and mass three, but it's not observable because I have no idea where this mass is over here. But if I then buy another sensor and now I'm sensing, so the only change here is I've sensed, I'm now sensing the position of this third mass or mass three, this system is now controllable and observable again, even though these are not dynamically coupled to each other. So this is um, really basic, you know, some of the things that you would see if you took your first graduate class in linear systems analysis. The main takeaway message here is the ability to infer process states and control process states depends on innate system dynamics. That's the coupling between the, the, the different masses 
and the selection of sensors and actuators. So where are we putting sensors on the system? Where are we actuating the system? Okay, so I hope, I hope that made sense to everyone uh, here. The other thing that we can look at is how do we um, understand how the different states of the system are coupled together and how that affects observability, controllability. So observability, controllability, these are binary metrics. So it's either they are or they aren't. But that's not the true story. And this is, I think, one of the hard lessons that we've learned through uh, powder bed fusion and trying to look at those type of processes is that you can have um, weakly controllable systems and strongly controllable systems and or and the same thing with observability. Um, and so there are ways in which we can quantify that. I'm not going to go into too much detail um, uh, here, but basically if my springs here, my spring and dam damper here are strong, um, it, 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 this, this, this metric I'm showing here, basically you're looking at the parity between different states here. What this is basically saying is I can decompose this four state system into a two state system easily. And then there's also some implications that we can think about in terms of how easily controlled is the system, how easily observed is the system. And if I have weak coupling that I'm making then the spring and damper weak, we have more parity between here. And this is actually saying I cannot easily decompose the system into something simpler. Also, if I have this, this comparison of I have weak coupling between my systems, but I add a sensor and an actuator. So I add my force here. I actually add my, my other output here. This becomes and looks more like the strongly coupled system where I have the strong differences between um, you know, basically my states. I have two dominant states and two uh, weak states. So this is all to say that there are tools available for systems analysis where we can start to understand how does system dynamics affect the ability to control the process and how does sensor and actuator design affect the ability to control the process. Okay, so that may have been a little bit abstract. I want to take this to um, things that we can think about from additive manufacturing processes, which is aligned with um, some projects in Hammer. And for those of you who haven't seen powder bed fusion before, the main idea behind powder bed fusion is you have a laser source. Um, you can then direct the laser source onto this top surface of powder on the part, and you can fuse together two dimensional layers of the powder. And then by doing this over and over and over again, stacking these two dimensional fused layers together, you can make three dimensional parts. And so, so when I look at this, um, I look at inputs. So here's our selection of inputs, say laser power, diameter, where the center it is. I look at outputs. These are what we could potentially measure. So I can measure say the base plate thermocouple and I can measure the temperature using thermal cameras from kind of a bird's eye view of what's going on. And there are ways in which you can um, look at the admission that comes off this part, infrared emission comes off this part, direct it back to this mirrors and get idea what's called a, a melt pool camera or what we call a coaxial camera. So these are the types of um, actuators, inputs and measurements that we can get with powder bed fusion. I, I didn't really go into it too much in terms of what the system equations look like, but the equations that you would write, um, going back a few here, these, this would be your A matrix, this would be what's called your B matrix, and this would be called your C matrix. We can write um, complex manufacturing processes, um, oftentimes derived from finite element methods. We can write them into equations that look very, very similar to this. Um, this discretization of taking a, a PDE and turning it into this these, um, set of ODEs, this ends up with very large uh, model orders around the order of 10 to the third to 10 to the fourth states, um, but that's something we can deal with. So what we've done in terms of looking at this is we've started to look at powder bed fusion as a controlled system. And I wanna compare this to how powder bed fusion has typically been done. Uh, tip, powder bed fusion is usually just done in open loop. We have G code that just says, here will be the laser centroid in time. Here will be the laser powers in time. Just send that in and see what happens. 
right? So sometimes um, people will use a process model and then they'll maybe compare what happened, that's why, with what they estimate would have happened from a model. But in general, it's just this forward process. You just put in inputs and then you get something out. We're trying to apply feedback control um, with paradigms like this and kind of mapping why you X that I had before, why is the measurable temperatures on the top surface of a part? You are laser parameters, for instance, power and centroid, and X would be then all the temperatures throughout the part. So we can only see the top surface of a part being made by a powder bit fusion because that's where our thermal cameras can access. But there's actually a temperature state throughout the entire, a set of temperature states throughout the entire part that we care about and want to know what that is. We can also specify what is the desired states. So what, how do we want the temperature profiles to be in this entire part and, and set up control loops like this? Okay, so with paradigms like this, oh, and, and, and just kind of as a side, what we want is we want to achieve a desired temperature state despite boundary conditions as well. So th here's an example of, of um, from an older paper where they're scanning a E-beam in this case over top of this overhang. And you can see the thermal artifact because you're really close to this overhang and you get um, poor thermal management because your laser power is too hot because you're close to the overhang where in the bulk it's, it's perfectly fine. So um, that's what we're trying to do. Basically have, be able to specify what we want the temperature profiles to be regardless of how close we are to a boundary, overhangs, any other things. So analogies to hammer. Um, so why uh, could be the measurements, right? Surface temperatures, surface geometries, et cetera. What we're measuring, U would be the actuations. So for instance, uh, an imposed deformation vector if we're talking about incremental sheet forming. X would be the states, deformation, temperature, microstructural characteristics, and XD would be the desired states. What do we want in terms of deformation, temperature, microstructural characteristics, et cetera? Okay. So, so what have we learned from powder bed fusion? So we have learned that powder bed fusion is both controllable, controllable and observable. That's necessary for um, control systems to be applied, but they are weakly controllable and observable. And we've seen some of the ramifications of this being very, very weak. So there are tools, just like I showed those bar charts of how strongly or weakly observable a system is to understand um, what modes are strongly controllable. And so this is kind of an obvious result. This is a two-dimensional cross-section of a part. And if we're putting in a laser on the top surface, um, this heat map shows that the, the closer you are to the laser, the more controllable those temperature states are, say here, here, here. And the farther away you are, the more weakly controllable those are. I think that's not too uh, surprising. So this would be one mode shape, if you think of this as like a, a decomposition of temperature profiles you can impose. The second one, the second most strong controllability mode is given here. And then as you go on, this would be the weakest mode. Basically means that if I wanted to have a high temperature here, but no, but not a high temperature everywhere else, that'd be a very difficult thing to do. So we can look at system dynamics, we can look at what actuation and sensing channels we have, and we can understand how, what can we affect in terms of states um, in a system. Observability, we can look at sensor selection. So if we have, if we just sense the temperature in this red triangle here, this has an energy of, of 12. <laughs> Sorry, I'm uh, fighting a little cold here. <clears throat> but as we add more temperature nodes that we are sensing, our ability to observe and estimate states becomes better. But you may notice as you look at this table, you have diminishing returns. So as we add sensors, we don't get as big of a jump. And so this, this shows that continually just piling on sensors may not be the best idea. So so with this, this kind of these really basic ideas, we started to look at um, Oh, concepts in terms of, you know, this would be the typical temperature feel or temperature measurement you would get out of laser bed uh, uh, power, laser powder bed fusion, where you get these really, really detailed maps of temperature um, around the melt pool, say here. But the question is, do we need all this data? That's, um, we're talking about megapixel arrays. Do we need to be a chug all this data? Or could we get away with just sampling a few different temperatures? And would that be enough to fully construct 
state information. So just like the mass spring damper example, by measuring the position of mass one, we can uh, estimate the position of mass three, right? Do we need to measure every single temperature? So, so that was kind of an idea that we took um, and we started to look at three-dimensional versions of what's called uh, common filters as a way to estimate states. And so what's going to be shown here in this video, let's see, this runs. Okay, this was working earlier. Why is this not working? Um, this was working just 10 minutes before my presentation. So I'm sorry that this is not showing up here. Um, but what we do here is we can, we, we look at simulations where we look at true data. Uh, we have an open loop linear model where we're intentionally, um, perturbing the thermal mechanical properties. So this is, uh, basically just looking at one model where we're using room temperature data and one model, which we're using melting point thermal, thermal mechanical information. And then looking at how a Kalman filter as an estimator can estimate not only the top surface temperatures, but all of the, the temperatures within the part as well to get full state information. So sorry that's not running. I hope the other videos run. We can also look at what happens if we have simpler sensors. So this would be off-axis camera. This is the, the full build uh, plate or the full, um, the full I say, bird's eye view of the, the top surface. This would be coaxial. So uh, coaxial cameras, and this would be another form of how we can sample coaxial um, uh, cameras. And we can start to play with, around with ideas of, in terms of how many actual pixels do we need to read to get state information. So the selection here is just kind of random. We, we found random ways to do it. The main, the main message from this is that we definitely do not need extremely dense temperature arrays to understand uh, an estimate of the states. So you can in this plot here, lower is better. This is a metric of the air signal. And so as you increase the number of pixels you sample, the air becomes better as we look at, say, for instance, this plot, but we have diminishing returns. Okay. And so by continually sampling more pixels and then the computational overhead that has that goes with that, we're not really getting a better estimate uh, up to a certain point. If we have really sparse sampling right here, say, um, two to the third, which is just eight pixels. That's that's obviously poor, but as we um, increase that just a little bit, we start to get diminishing returns. Okay, so this was we had a lot of um, sorry analogies to hammer. Um, you know, our hammer processes such as incremental sheet forming, controllable and observable. How far does that control actuation reach? Like, so we looked at powder bed fusion. We could see how far we can actually actuate temperatures. What type of sensors, displacement, temperature, et cetera, do we need? And where should we place them? And where do we actuate? Selection, selection of the actuation vector, um, things like that. So we had a lot of, I guess, enthusiasm for this idea. And so what we did is we went to Open Additive, which some of the, some of the Ohio State people are probably familiar with Open Additive. They're a company out of um, the, the Dayton area uh, where they have um, uh, open, open uh, open architecture powder bed fusion systems. And we did this experiment. This experiment, uh, the paper for this is under AFRL review right now. So hopefully this will be submitted very, very soon. And it'll be an archive. But we did this experiment where we basically measured everything you could possibly measure and did a set of experiments uh, to study this. Um, the details of this aren't too important, but we collected a lot of data and we also in collected internal temperature data to try and prove out the, the filtering or estimation algorithms we're looking. Can we use surface temperature information to predict temperatures below the surface? And, okay, I don't know why this isn't working. Of course, the videos aren't gonna work all of a sudden. Let's see. Okay, sorry about this. Um, but this would be nice, pretty videos um, that you could take a look at. Uh, I can share the slides if people wanna look at these later. Um, but these are thermocouple data, et cetera. And so we had a lot of excitement for, for running this. And what we found, and this is the video I really wanted to show. Let me try.
Okay. I do, I do not know why it's, it's not working. It was working just minutes ago. The main thing to 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 real to, I guess to, to communicate here is that the the common filters or the estimators that we built in simulation for stainless steel when we started using data for Inconel and changed all our model parameters everything to Inconel failed miserably. And so what I mean by failed miserably is that the estimates were unstable. And so you actually had you can actually see the temperature ranges here. Uh, fluctuating between positive five times 10 to the third to negative five times 10 to the third, as an example. And not only, not only did using real data cause this to fail miserably, when we started going back to the drawing board and looking at um, simulations, the simulations that were working with the model per parameters for stainless steel, if we switch those model parameters to Inconel and do simulations with, with the Inconel, that actually completely failed too. And so we're still trying to understand this, but what we, we, we believe to be true is that this is uh, purely a, a fact that our systems are very weakly observable. And that means that estimates of states at this top surface are um, not extremely pre predictive of subsurface temperatures. And we have to do a lot more work to try and get, um, to, to get this understanding. So that was um, kind of the, the realization that we came to through this, the the good news is we is that we have been able to get this working, um, but I think this is kind of a little bit of a word of, of warning: is that if processes for Hammer are weakly observable, these ideas in terms of building feedback control loops will they actually work? And, and we've shown that just by changing thermomechanical properties and nothing else, we can go from being stable estimation, proper estimation, accurate estimation to completely. Um, unregulated estimation. And so that's uh, um, something that we have to really carefully consider um, for, for types of projects like that. Um, assume these are not going to work. Sorry about that. Okay. The, the main message here is that we've done a lot of work to change the sensing paradigms and model construction to get this to work. So, but we still believe we're kind of at this cusp of, of instability with our estimators because of this lack of observability. And also, since then, we started looking at control. So if you look at the diagram in, in, in thrust four, there was model predictive control there. We're looking at model predictive control to this process as well. And this is going to be my last thing I wanted to, uh, to talk about here, just to show that we are currently applying model predictive control in simulation uh, using both ensemble common filters, that's the state estimator, and model predictive control. Model predictive control is nice because you can uh, put constraints into it. So you can have um, a, a really nice platform for uh, introducing constraints such as actuator limits, uh, sensing limits, state limits in terms of temperatures, deformations that will cause um, a rupture and things like that. We can start to integrate those into controller design. Um, just like before, in terms of perturbations to our system, we use uh, we, we pretty wildly vary the, the thermal mechanical properties of our system. So we have a reference or desired temperature profile that has these properties, linear models that have these properties, and then closed loop controllers that have other properties. We want to basically intentionally add uncertainty to the process to make sure that we can still regulate outputs. And of course, that one's not going to work either. Um, sorry about that. Um, and this one's not going to work either, I'm assuming. Okay. Dave, so, so we'll have to probably move to Vic pretty soon, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, if you don't mind, we'll put all this online and, and into the into the Teams folder. Um, I'll still let you finish up, but yeah, but uh, we'll, we'll get that. And, and again, this is to kind of introduce you to the community. We, and this is absolutely important stuff because we want to do real thermal mechanical processing. So this, this is absolutely in. Yeah, yeah I, can, I can post this and people can look at it. On their own time. This is a great slide because this is a static slide here. Um, so, so what this is showing here, this is a, a metric of um, control error, and think of this as the energy of the control error signal, or or how poorly um, we're performing. And this is then the infinity norm, or this is the worst case error. And so, what this shows is we have an open loop model that is um, inaccurate, which all open loop models are, that we get um, basically too hot. 
on these parts. And then we have common filters that estimate the states and control uh, closed loop control that do significantly better than just the open loop control paradigm that's being used uh, right now with Potter bit fusion. So this is showing you both the energy of the air signal and then the infinity norm of the air signal. Okay, so um, so I think some things to think about for analogies to hammer. Um, MPC is ideal because it handles input and output constraints very well. And this project has some transferability to hammer projects. And then how do we potentially augment this with AI and machine learning? So I just wanted to, to follow up with some um, concluding remarks. The, the work that we're doing, I would say, is very aspirational. We're looking at not necessarily how is Potter Bit Fusion being controlled right now, but how could it be controlled in the future when you start to bring in some of these elements uh, here? So right now, if we look at the computation to real time ratio, it's 10 to the 5. So that means for every time step that we have to do in terms of computation to do a state estimator and MPC, which is being proposed in, in Thrust 4, that takes us 10 to the 5 times longer for the computation in comparison to real time. Um, so that may sound very, very alarming, but I think there's much that can be optimized. So adaptive meshing, this is something that Nate is looking at right now that cuts your ratio down to 10 to the 3. But you can also look at model order reduction, um, FPGA acquisition and GPU processing, and then also AI ML to offload some of this computational burden. And I think I'm going to make a naive statement here because we haven't studied this problem yet with hammer applications, but I think many of the hammer processes are computationally easier. And that's because um, how this is being proposed is, is sequential actions. And because it's sequential actions, as opposed to real-time control, for powder bed fusion, that allows you to do computations in between those sequential actions. So I think this problem becomes easier, but it's still something to keep your eye on. Um, actuator and sensor selection is absolutely critical and uh, intellectually interesting. So what we've done so far is, is really, I would say uh, interesting, but crude, basically just starting to pull out pixels that you're sampling, but there's a, a wealth of literature and actuator and sensor selection in the network theory community, and we're not leveraging this. So, so you know, this is just a random sampling of say, okay, this is the number of pixels we want to do, but are those actually optimized in terms of which pixels we're measuring? Probably not, right? So, I think there's a lot that could be done in terms of sensor selection, uh, actuator selection, things like that that we could could leverage if we have good system models and systems analysis for for Hammer. So that's it. That's uh, I just wanted to open up to any questions people have. Um, and thanks for your time. Thank you very much, David. Let, let's, in the sake of time, let's let Vic Castillo uh, queue up next, and uh, then we'll, we'll save a little time for a discussion at the end. Um, while we're changing, I know um, Vic has actually some projects in mind uh, to do with Hammer uh, as, we, as we go forward, and he's got some uh, um, ideas that he's floating within uh, within the uh, LLNL as well and uh, the Department of Energy. So Vic, let me turn it over to you to introduce yourself more efficiently than I can. Fantastic. Can you can you hear me well and can you see my screen? Okay, oh. so I'm going to go. Um, I, I'm going to rush through these uh, slides. I have a lot of slides and uh, I'm 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 good at speeding through this kind of stuff. Uh, I want to introduce um, the Livermore Lab and some of the projects I'm working on. Um, I also want to talk, I, I think a lot of this is going to tie into a lot of things that David talked about er, earlier too. So uh, I think it was a, 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 it's a good uh, collaboration here, uh, potential just uh, uh, going on. Um, first of all, I want to uh, introduce my uh, collaborators. Uh, these first three uh, were pro stocks. Um, Yiping and uh, Dillian have, have now been converted to staff. Uh, a lot of these other folks like uh, Ethan and James and Yamin and and um, Andrew and Eric, these these are all undergraduates that worked on the team um, as summer students. Uh, there are a lot of uh, graduate students, uh, so we we have all kinds uh, working working in uh, on this project together. Um, so the Lawrence Livermore National Lab, where I work, is a um, is a national lab through the Department of Energy. Uh, it's about forty miles east of San Francisco in Northern California. Uh, it's a one mile uh, square research center. Uh, we have often the fastest supercomputer in the world. Of course, we're always leapfrogging um, Oak Ridge. We'll have it one year. We'll have it one year. Japan might have it another year. So it's always a leapfrogging thing. Uh, we do a lot of advanced manufacturing. 
Uh, we have uh, the uh, National Ignition Facility that's been making big news for our demonstration of, of fusion energy. And uh, that, that shows uh, the tar NIF target cha chamber right there. Uh, one thing about the uh, uh, supercomputers that I skipped over is that they are becoming faster and faster through the use of GPUs. So by using GPUs on these, on these large uh, big iron machines, we're really accelerating our computations. And so uh, uh, machine learning is really suitable for um, GPU uh, processing. These are some important tools that we have that will be very applicable for uh, Hammer. Uh, first is uh, uh, the CERAC uh, open source uh, uh, thermal mechanical tool set. Uh, CERAC uh, is, is an amazing set of, of tools. It's, it's still kind of infant, but uh, uh, it, it's a it wraps around our MFEM capability, which are finite element uh, li libraries that run super, super fast, and they are GPU enabled. Uh, they have a lot of capabilities for topological optimization, for instance. Uh, in fact, this, uh, this right here just uh, uh, is a project that I just finished where we uh, did uh, added multi-material additive manufacturing uh, and generated a, uh, this device that has a negative uh, coefficient of thermal expansion. And the idea is that if there's a lens on here uh, for like a, a camera system, if the, the lens expands when it heats and contracts when it cools, this housing expands when it cools and contracts when it heats so that the focal length remains constant. So this was designed by our, our uh, Livermore Design Optimization using MFEM and CERAC. And uh, it's a design for intentionally for 3D printing. Uh, so this is the kind of stuff we can, we can, uh, we can generate with, with, the, with our tool sets. Merlin and Maestro are a way of running lots and lots of of, uh, of uh, runs, simulations, and uh, machine learning combined on our supercomputers. And it's open source too. Uh, we have an advanced manufacturing lab. This is a fairly new facility for us. Uh, this has just been built. We do a lot of 3D printing and polymers and metals and all kinds of stuff. Um, it's pretty open. We're, uh, we're outfitting it right now. Hopefully we'll have a future, uh, in the future, have a Machina Labs a robotic cell that does the incremental forming. That's one thing that I'm, I'm, I'm pushing on pushing on right now. I uh, just had a, a good chat with uh, Machina Labs yesterday about this. This is, a, this is a state of the art for our smart advanced manufacturing. This is not my slide. This is a, a, my friend Brian's slide. But uh, again, we do these powder bed fusion um, um, observation and exquisitely detailed finite element modeling of this. Uh, where we're actually doing ray tracing for the for the uh, 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 deposition of the laser energy uh, on these on these spherical particles and doing the the, the melt of this, um, we are working on these digital twins. Or Brian Brian is working on this digital twinning of some of these uh, advanced manufacturing. This is this is a, a additive manufacturing from polymer system uh, where they squeeze something out that's, that's a little bit like very very tiny toothpaste uh, to make uh, make parts. My, uh, the program that supports a lot of my work is called the HBC for Manufacturing Project uh, program uh, out of DOE, Advanced Manufacturing Office. Um, uh, what we do is provide scientific machine learning tools uh, to manufacturers. So we use our simulation and machine learning, and I'll get more into that. And what the, uh, the DOE is very interested in, in, in particular the Advanced Manufacturing Office, is helping the U.S. manufacturers save energy because a, about a quarter of the nation's energy is consumed in the manufacturing uh, of, of products. You know, here's a here's steel being uh, produced. Here's aluminum ingot, uh, and here's an issue that I, I worked on is the the, the cracking that happens at, uh, at uh, because of the residual stress. Uh, this is the uh, uh, this is uh, the loading of a of a glass furnace. Um, which was uh, uh, produced sheet glass or float glass is another word for that. Um, this is what I mean by scientific machine learning. Uh, this is where we are. Um, we, we we think about a bunch of things to to, to simulate. We we sample our design space in a smart way. Um, uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of work done on on good sampling because we can't afford sometimes can't afford to do a, a, you know thousands of simulations. Maybe we can do hundreds. Uh, we run the simulations and we curate them, and then we use some neural network uh, uh, methods. One I, I particularly like is the autoencoder. The autoencoder takes our state, our you know temperature, velocity fields, 
takes our states and pushes it through a, a bottleneck that reduces the the, the dimensionality of the of, of the uh, system, and then um, then we can uh, attach uh, we can we can learn how how that uh, that uh, latent space is controlled by our control variables and our design variables, and then get actually get our state back out. So that's it's a it's a very quick way uh, to run to to uh, replicate the simulation. Uh, it, it's a, a surrogate method for replicating the simulations, but it runs thousands and thousands of times faster uh, than, than the simulations themselves. Uh, and also we can get these, uh, 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 what I call quality maps out of this. This is, this is a, a projection of the latent space and maybe uh, some quality uh, uh, on, on here. We can actually uh, look at each simulation as a single, single point and see uh, and, and extract out what we expect out of that. It could be any kind of quality metric. Uh, it could be, uh, uh, you know, uh, anything that the, uh, the, the industry values. So this, is, this has been a very valuable tool out of this. I'll give you an example from uh, glass manufacturing. Um, here's a, here's a, a, a typical furnace. You can see over here, um, can you guys see my cursor? Yes. Okay, so over here is where the other image is where the raw material comes in. And uh, this, this whole thing is about the size of a, of a um, ranch style house. And uh, there's a little window here. Uh, here's a couple of my students. Uh, we actually, you can actually approach this with a, uh, while you're wearing this flame proof jacket and, and look in there and actually see the, 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 uh, uh, the, the molten glass through a, through a welding lens. So it's really hard to, for them to instrument these, these systems. So they rely a lot on simulations. And this is actually some of the tracer runs on the simulations that uh, that we did. Uh, this is a cartoon of the of that tank. So the raw materials come in here and they cannot put an impeller in here. So it's very difficult for them to mix this. What they do is they have um, a, 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 a compound that outgasses, that outgassing um, causes the, the glass to expand and become buoyant and dry these, these convective loops that actually uh, determine or that actually uh, mix up everything. The the uh, determination of this this hot spot or the spring zone is is governed by the the loop itself and also the uh, the gas burners. A very very complex system. Uh, when they want when their system is out of control because they brought in some uh, recycled material, it takes them about a week to do one simulation. And so in in that week they have they have uh, produced a lot of bad uh, bad material that they have to dump out in the uh, uh, in the parking lot and and, and reuse. It's a very big waste of energy. And once they have an, uh, uh, a couple of answers after a week, week of runs, they, they could try some things, but then they had to wait a few days to see if it worked and maybe they run some more. So it, they need a very quick answer. And what we did is we, we ran the simulations and we learned them, uh, learned the simulations, created a, a reduced order model, um, the surrogate model for them and created this GUI. And what you'll see is, um, uh, uh, I'll show you a little video here where it actually uh, you know, a person will come in and change change a setting, and you can see that these these uh, these quality predictors change almost instantly, and the and then about you know 20 seconds later the uh, the, the the flow field changes. So here here's uh, here's where we come in. And we we change maybe the, the the energy in one of the gas ports. The quality metrics uh, are instantly changed, and in you know short period of time, we get an answer that would take the, this company a week to produce. So uh, the, the, these uh, um, neural networks in inference mode are super, super fast and can work to give almost real time uh, predictions. Uh, the, the other example is uh, aluminum casting where they had the cracks. Uh, this is uh, um, uh, where the, uh, these, this is at their pilot plant where they're generating these little mini uh, ingots and we actually, um, uh, my my uh, uh, collaborator Adrian from uh, Los Al uh, from uh, Oak Ridge uh, ran the simulations, and here's an example of the simulations where uh, we're looking at the hot tearing indicator. This is the residual stress built up after the solidification. The purple is the liquid, but then you can see that where the, the residual stress is built up. This is where it's likely to crack. Uh, these simulations took on the order of 24 to 36 hours. Uh, but what, what we can do is generate this uh, fast running surrogate model that predicted the distribution of the, of the residual stress and predicted the regions where, the, uh, where it's likely to be a high, uh, high stress, where likely where there's going to be cracking, for instance, in, in the ingot. 
we also work with uh, um, uh, uh, companies like uh, Vast Power Systems. It's a startup doing uh, uh, um, uh, uh, these uh, combustors, uh, these uh, turbine combustors that would generate uh, power for the grid. Uh, another uh, uh, is uh, Machina Labs, who's a, a partner in this uh, in Hammer. Uh, they do incremental forming. You guys are very familiar with the with their with their tool set. Uh, we're 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 using uh, some of these tools that we have to model the deformation process and using the, uh, the machine learning to actually learn learn it and make faster predictions than the, than the supercomputers can make with the the full simulations. Uh, another, another example is working with AK Steel. This is their uh, uh, formation of sheet, sheet steel out of ingot. Uh, this, they, they, we used about 100 variables here uh, and the machine learning will, would predict the uh, grain structure based on things like even the runout table, the distribution of the, of the, of the uh, um, uh, sprays at the runout table. Uh, ArcelorMetal, we, uh, we actually modeled using open foam, the uh, flows of the molten steel uh, in the production of the ingots. They had a problem where the, uh, 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 these, uh, these uh, vortices would pull down some of the liquid flux and that would cause um, uh, imperfections in, in, the, uh, uh, in their ingots. So we, we worked out a way where they can balance these, these, uh, these vortices to have a more gentle flow and better mixing as a result. Um, we, we're working again with these mechanical interactions. This is, this is a little bit like the, uh, the, uh, the, the tip of the uh, incremental former on, on a piece of sheet metal. Uh, in this case, uh, you know, it's, it's very complicated, uh, the, the, the uh, modeling the, uh, the, the contact and the, the deformation. Um, the key to this is actually having really good um, uh, adaptive mesh refinement. Uh, and some of this can actually be done with machine learning. Um, there, there are, there are conventional ways, but sometimes you can learn where the gradients are going to be strongest and actually have the machine learning algorithm uh, uh, determine the, uh, uh, the, uh, the where, to, where to do the local refinement. Uh, this is work done by um, uh, uh, Google uh, DeepMind, actually, and we're, we're leveraging that for, for some of our work. Uh, so our key points is that neural networks can, can learn and predict these features of these very complex uh, processes, and we, we use simulation uh, on our supercomputers to generate the data. Uh, and we can actually augment that with physical data and production data. And we have a good uh, set of tools that we'd like to invite hammer folks to start to use. Um, and we can, we can save money for the companies. And, um, and this, this, here's a list of companies that um, I personally have worked with um, and, and some of the savings that they, they, they anticipate by bringing this to full TR, uh, higher TRL. And this is another uh, uh, student uh, that uh, Finnett was working on this project. And this is this we had this metal additive manufacturing capability. Uh, we made these rocket motors. We did these tests um, and actually did some exquisite uh, uh, data um, uh, um, uh, analysis and actually found this keyhole process, which is pretty uh, uh, a pretty important paper that we we published this um, uh, pretty uh, um, seminal paper here. But we have the whole data set that we um, are uh, have been, has been curated. And we plan to put this out as an open data set for people to go in and look at the grain structure of all this, uh, this uh, 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 powder bed um, fusion data. And um, uh, this will be uh, coming pretty soon. Un unfortunately, uh, uh, Ethan didn't finish uh, this summer, but hopefully this summer he can actually get this out published and get some papers out there to talk about, the, uh, to talk about this data set. So that's, that's my, uh, my quick rundown of my uh, 27 slides. Thank you, Vicky. That's that's yeah, great pod right there. Do you can you want to talk a little bit about some of the things that you're planning to do with us? That that, uh, that, that I think that would be useful. yeah. I have a pro a proposal in with uh, HPC for manufacturing program uh, for uh, to a two year uh, project to actually engage with Hammer and and start to bring in uh, some some students and professors bring them to the Livermore lab, or it could be virtual, in order to work with some of these tools and start to modify things and actually try to apply some of these tools that I talked about. And in particular, um, I'll bring up that tool page, try, try to bring up, um, try to incorporate these tool sets in a hammer because this is really um, uh, some cutting edge stuff and it's all open source. And that's the best part about it. It's open source, really high power uh, impact um, uh, software. Yeah, and I think also you talk about this. so the MFM could even run on these little Jetson computers and things like that and do things. That's right. Real -time. That's right. 
Oh, I, I right, forgot yeah. to have my Jetson. Uh, oh, here it is. I love this thing. This is my little uh, Jetson computer that, uh, um, I mean, you, you can run it even on this. You know, it's, it's open source and you can compile it. Um, uh, it's GPU, uh, this is very GPU heavy, uh, but it's, it's probably best on, on, on a desktop workstation to really get uh, some significant uh, um, pro, um, uh, simulations done. So, so I see a, a great future here for us. Yeah, developing some lightweight uh, computer and software systems that can allow us to do those inferences, and, and you know, and I think it, it ties together beautifully. Actually, with what Dave put up also, I think of um, you know, running running inferences to try to figure out what temperature and plastic strains are within a part, and do that um, at a, at the speed of manufacturers. Everything gets faster and faster. That 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 allows us to. Uh, Use the tools that have been built in material science for all these years to to, to locally get what we want. Um, questions for for either either uh, our awesome speakers today, uh, please. Okay, just to kind of remind you, the, the, these were intended to be uh, you know high quality turbo talks, and they were both were. They both had a high baud rate and very high quality, and and this is again to kind of get people known better within the hammer community and and you know, in, in interacting, and that's the whole idea here. So, um, Lawrence Livermore uh, has been a uh, intended collaborator from the start. Uh, Dave as, as well. Uh, so uh, please please bring them into things. We'll be uh, making them part of the community. Um, next week, as we uh, go forward, uh, or next week, next week is off, week after February 16th. Um, it's up to uh, the team at Case to put on the uh, hammer time, and I'm sure they will do a great job. And um, I don't know if there's anything else for the good of the order anyone would like to, to bring up. If if not, we'll see you guys in uh, two two Thursdays. And um, yeah, thanks thanks for the great talks. Great job, thank you. I guess I have, I have a question for David. Uh, sure. I don't know if we're gonna get kicked off here soon. Or no, not. no, no, no. <laughs> I, I'm gonna hang on. I, I'm gonna. I mean, if you don't mind, I'm gonna lurk around any any other discussion. So, yeah. Hi, uh, I'm a PhD student from Professor Waitress Group. And um, my question is, uh, you just mentioned that the computational cost to the um, running time ratio is like 10 to the power of five. Yeah, in, in the completely unoptimized state. All right, so this is more proof of concept. So yeah, we're not doing anything to really optimize that, but it's 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 hard, it's large, right? So yeah, um, I wanna ask more about that process is that um, is that you're collecting the updating states or parameters and then recalculate another um, FEM models? Is that what you mean by like? Yeah. Uh, so, so, so in that in that time, every this is a real time feedback loop. For, that's the intention, right? Yeah. Feedback loop. So every time step, say for instance, at one millisecond, would be a common uh, time step for a very dynamic process like powder infusion. Um, you have to estimate the states, and right now we're estimating all the states. I think there's a lot of um, a lot of computational advantage you can get by preferentially just estimating states, or most of your states being near the melt pool, and then have a coarser mesh farther away. Uh, but you have to estimate all the states, so on the order of ten to the four, ten to the five states, right now where we're at, that can be reduced a lot. And then you have to come up with an optimal input. So Using running an optimization routine to then say, okay, what will be my, what should be my power at the next time step, and then every every time step you're doing that. So that's uh, that's that's tough to do, and we're nowhere close to real time yet. But I think there's there is a there is a path forward. We just need to kind of employ every trick in the book. I see. And also, have you tried some kind of motive fidelity method for your um, FEM simulation? So can you repeat that? What what type of methods? Uh, it's motor fidelity methods. It's like you're fusing um, different FEM models with um, high fidelity, like with with FEM with smaller uh, grid and some FEM model with larger grid, and um, use motor fidelity method to come up with a um, like to fuse the data together to provide a 
more um cheaper but um without losing accuracy for your predictive models so so we're not fem people we, we use it as a tool so we're not the the best of that one the things we're doing i mean I, you couldn't really see the videos but we have denser mesh near the top surface um, that's a common thing to do and we're currently studying adaptive meshes so only having um, fine fine meshes near the melt pool where the temperature gradients are high and then coarse meshes elsewhere I see. Um, that that causes some problems because going back to the systems definition um pretty much all control systems assume that you have a constant number of states so that'd be in this case i see if you have like true adaptive meshes that that number of states actually is fluctuating every time step so we have to do some things to enforce that we have the same number of states every time we do a, a time step so that's that's a little bit of a, a unique um we'll say nuance to applying it to control I see thank you David I think your uh, your tongue is very inspiring and um very uh educative to us thank you thank you so much uh, hi, Dave. Uh, Robert here. I, I, I think uh, you know I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, here, a couple of uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is that uh, you mentioned that using sensors, you know, for, obviously you need that uh, for system estimation. And then uh, you talked about uh, you know uh, one thing that you found is that uh, actually over you know sensing is it's not a good thing. It does not help. Uh, there's a diminish uh, in return. And so the question is, uh, can one possibly use that strategy uh, for uh, to select uh, the number of sensors, the type, quality level, or resolution uh, of sensors uh, uh, at the beginning uh, when we build a system that, uh, for example, whatever a new set of uh, uh, machine, new machine uh, to do a certain thing. So basically, using the method that you have presented for sensor collection uh, right at the beginning. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I, and then that was like my last slide that, you know, there's a lot that we're not doing. We we just started just pairing sense, right. sensed uh, pixels at, at kind of a random um, with a certain distribution, right? But I think there's a much more intelligent way to do that. This is a, um, this has been, if you go to controls conference, there would be mm -hmm. dozens of talks about how do you select like given a finite sensing resource, how do you select location of your sensors correctly? We're not leveraging any of that right now. I think I think that's that could be, um, I guess, a really interesting um, thing to study. So, and and also like you know, with powder diffusion, um, you know, right now we're we're using what is typically used, which is, is temperature sensors, right? You start talking about some of these other hammer applications, uh, and I, I don't necessarily think that temperature sensors are always the best right they're, they're obviously informative but displacement sensors as you deforming materials so now you have multiple modes of sensing that you can integrate together um that that yield i guess interesting um, and of course we're interested in a lot more than just temperature i mean playing with using deformation and temperature together is a kind of metallurgical superpower yeah um, yeah and uh, yes, and, and there are two things I, I think here, just to a little bit follow up on this, that one is the sensor placement, right? Where do you place the sensor? I mean, uh, I, I assume that the finite element model, if you have one, that will give you some idea about the using possibly, you know, as a hypothesis, using the minimum number of sensors uh, to get you the, the maximum number of uh, or amount of information that you would need to estimate the structural response. So, and then the other uh, aspect is that uh, what kind of a sensor grade, if you will, right, uh, is, is needed in order to, you know, whether you can basically use a cheap sensor versus uh, using a high cost sensor to yeah. achieve the same result. Yeah, no, uh, and I think I'm, I'm a, I have a little better idea of like where and then what quantity in terms of how you would do that. That's an optimization routine. Yeah study before um with these type of these type of networks the quality thing that goes into um um uncertainty and, and noise level characteristics and things like that that i think opens up some some interesting ideas that i haven't really thought about too much but that's a, a good thing to think about i think the one thing is that if you look at additive manufacturing or all these other um well allied fields there's this big push to like pretty pictures i would say 
with this, the thermal cameras, like these really dense thermal camera temperature uh, or thermal camera arrays mm. will create great pictures. But in terms of real-time control, that's a terrible thing to have because now you have to sample um, at the rates of the process on the order of kilohertz, megapixel arrays. And if you look at all high-speed thermal cameras, you can do that, but you can't do it in real time. You can store it on RAM and then use it later, but you can't use it in real time. So how can you get away with on the order of 100 temperature measurements, could that be processed in real time? I, I think it could with uh, FPGAs, but um, you know the, the best thermal camera companies in the, in the world can't do it microPixel arrays right now in real time. I, I think uh, when it comes to real time control, the lag lag you know in the system certainly plays a you know decisive role. So I, I can imagine probably if you have uh, those uh, super resolution cameras, you can use the data that you have obtained for some sort of like uh, offline training. Yep. Uh, maybe of your, you know, machine, uh, you know, uh, uh, machine learning models, but uh, certainly not for real-time control purpose. For that, you probably need some reduced uh, high uh, fidelity, you know, uh, models, right? Like surrogate models. Yep. Uh, it's part of the control algorithm. Yeah. Uh, another quick question. Uh, you, you, I think you mentioned that you pose a problem as uh, predicting the temperature underlining you know, underneath the, the surface, when we do this uh, uh, powder bed fusion uh, by using, you know, sensing at the top level. Yeah. Uh, so that, uh, so I think uh, just just to clarify, are you posing that problem as an estimation uh, problem, or I mean, if you have, you know, if one has, you know, uh, full knowledge of the process through some uh, heat uh, mass. Uh, transfer, you know, models and so on. Uh, how would that physical information uh, inform and uh, help with the uh, estimation? Uh, parallel, in parallel to the sensing uh, information that you get, or how do they, would they be able to relate to each other? Yeah, so I had to go through that quite quickly because of, of time constraints, but that, that's precisely what we're doing. So we're using finite element models that have, you know, baked into it uh, thermal mechanical constants, right? And so then we're mm -hmm. using element models, basically taking the top surface temperature and using estimators, which are basically feedback feedback mechanisms for sensing, right? And projecting those temperatures down using the physics of the process is, it, is the idea. So we're using a, a tool called an ensemble Kalman filter, mm -hmm. uh, a variety of different um, estimation tools that will do this for you um, under the class of particle filters. Mm -hmm. So um, I think there's that that's yeah, basically what we're doing. We're using a combination of the physics based model and, and measurements to fill in the entire temperature state. Good. Well, thank you. We can talk more in the context of a T4 projects and so on, but I find it very interesting. Thank you for the presentation. I think we're almost done with the overtime period, but um, Vic, you, you don't have any problem with me sharing up what you sent me. I haven't shared that up. You, you sent me a, a two page, kind of page and a half document that kind of maybe two pages that had some of your key ideas in it and uh, how, how collaborations work. I wouldn't mind, I think you might be muted.